Good day, everyone, and welcome back from your service sessions, your workshop blocks, and what I hope were some fun district dinners. Uh, super excited to see your faces again because we're moving into a very exciting session. So uh, introducing international trustee Tana Early to walk us through it. Thank you, Billy. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, I'll just get started. Um, so the networking session is an exciting opportunity for CKI members, alumni, Kiwanis members, uh, and working professionals to connect across the globe. The session is going to include a panel discussion of six great professional leaders in a diversity of fields. We'll be discussing general career advice, career advice specifically for 2020 graduates, as well as accepting additional qu uh, questions from the audience if time allows. We'll also be hosting a speed networking portion for CKI members to connect with professionals, Kiwanis family members, and alumni in their field of interest. The session is going to take place on our Zoom call. Then we're going to move to the Glimpse app that I'm sure you guys are familiar with by now. Uh, if you haven't downloaded that, go ahead and get it downloaded, please. Um, and then Glimpse will match you up with professionals uh, for about two minutes at a time. We will reconvene on the same Zoom call at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time for the CKI Next closing session. If you haven't downloaded Glimpse, again, just go ahead and get it downloaded. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to our membership committee, Chair McKenzie, to kick off uh, our panel with introductions. All right, hello everyone. So I'll just wait till Tana shares her screen real quick, then we'll get started. So um, first of all, thank you all for coming to the networking session. We're super excited for you guys to be here and see what we have in store for you. So as Tana said, I'm Mackenzie Steele. I am the International Membership Committee Chair. I go to West Virginia University and I double major in political science and women and gender studies. So I will turn it over to the rest of my committee to introduce themselves. I'll go since I'm underneath you. Um, my name is Tana. I'm an international trustee liaison to the professional development subcommittee for membership. I um, go to the University of Alabama. I'm studying environmental science. I'll pass it on to Erica. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica. I'm from um, CNH. I also serve as their current administration and operations chair. And I'm from UC San Diego and I study international business. And then that's all you're next. All right, hello everyone. So my name is Azal Lipdu. I'm the current district governor for the Carolinas district. Uh, I'm a senior at University of North Carolina, Carolina at Charlotte and I'm currently studying computer science. All right, so next we're gonna have our panelists introduce themselves. We'll just go in order as the headshots are shown here. So if you guys wanna go ahead and unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves. Hi everybody, my name is Zeal Van Heuvel. I am an account executive at Google. I've been there for about 12 years. Did my undergrad and my MBA at Michigan. And in that time I was on um, Circle Pace board. Nice to meet you all. Hi everyone, my name is Oliver Chung, um, formerly of University of Washington where I served in the Circle K club as webmaster, district international positions as uh, tech chairs and web ad hoc chair. Um, I'm currently a engineer at Dell Technologies where I write code all day. Hello, uh, I'm Natalie Schmatello. I currently work, I graduated from the University of Akron in political science and I got my master's degree in political management from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I'm currently a director in media buying for FP1 Strategies in Arlington, Virginia. Hi, I'm Anthony Lau. Um, I'm now an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the College of New Jersey. Um, I actually got my undergrad at Duke University, a double major in biomedical and electrical engineering. So I was in Circle K there um, as part of the Carolinas District. I was uh, the district bulletin editor. And then I did my PhD at the University of Virginia at the Center for Applied Biomechanics, which I also did work, uh, was also doing Circle K there as well. 
Hi everyone, my name is Liz. I'm currently an intern at the Orlando Law Group um, and I'm a student at Barry University School of Law, so it's still a work in progress for me. Um, I graduated from West Virginia University with a degree in fashion merchandising and minors in business administration and event planning. And in CKI, I was a uh, West Virginia District Governor for four years. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Lee. I currently work as the Training and Technical Assistance Director at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations. Whew, it's a really long company name. You can call it APCHO for short. Um, basically, we're a not-for-profit uh, national association that uh, advocates for health equity for all, regardless of your ability to pay and your insurance status. Uh, I also work as a part-time lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, in the past, I used to uh, be in the um, in Circle K at UC Berkeley. Um, I've been in the Qantas family for 19 years now. I currently serve as the Golden Gate Regional Advisor um, for the Cal Nipah District. In terms of education, I went to Cal for my undergrad and got my master's in healthcare administration and interprofessional leadership at UCSF. Nice to meet you all. Alrighty, so first of all, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're super excited to hear from you. And next up, we will be um, asking a few pre-selected questions that the committee has for you all. So I will begin with the first question and feel free to answer them in any order if you'd like. Um, so the first question we have is, what was the most difficult moment in your early career and how did you overcome it? I can kick off and break the silence here. So, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, I, gosh, I reflected this, this is, a, this is actually probably the most difficult question to answer. And I brainstormed with my partner a lot and just thinking back, oh gosh, what was the most difficult thing um, that I experienced right out of college? And I have to say it was experiencing having imposter syndrome. Um, for those who may not be familiar with imposter syndrome, um, folks with imposter syndrome have this tendency to have low self-confidence and fear of failure. And so they experience this kind of constant internal struggle between achieving success and avoiding being found out. Um, and also just having this um, struggle that pre really prevents you from reaching your full, uh, full potential. So this was probably the most difficult you know, thing I experienced. And I learned along the way that you know, um, I just, it's just so important to reflect on one, your passion, right? What you, what you really care about and what, and what you want to do, um, why you're doing it and who you want to do it for. Um, and also reflect on your amazing set of interpersonal skills that you may have or technical skills and even um, reflect on your own lived experiences um, and use that to uh, achieve success in your, in your careers. Um, and also later on, I really learned the value of having um, humility um, and practicing cultural humility. How do I be, um, how do I practice openness and appreciation and flexibility and acceptance and be okay with not knowing everything, but that, you know, um, that I'm okay with, you know, reflecting and learning, continuing to learn and, um, and not really equating not knowing as my, you know, my level of intelligence. Um, so that's something that I felt like I experienced, and I think a lot of people experience it. Um, so that's something that I um, had the most difficulty with in my early on my, in my career, um, having that imposter syndrome. But um, over time, have gotten over it, just uh, really reflecting on cultural humility, reflecting on myself, on my passion, and my existing skills. And I feel like I've, I've been doing okay <laughs> in my career so far. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, would anyone else like to answer this question? I was just gonna, gonna say plus, plus one to everything that Joe said. said. This, this, this question was hard because thinking back that far and remembering what I felt like 12 years ago, that's the number one thing that came to mind as well. But the, I, I would say in addition to everything Joe said, remember to give yourself grace. You're not gonna know everything on day one. You're not gonna know it all in year one. Take the time that you need to learn and be vulnerable about what you know and what you don't know. Surround yourself with the people who can help you get to where you want to be. Thank you. That's super good advice as well. I will jump in and add that um, it's okay to fail. Um, I was never told this and my first set of midterms, I came very close to failing a couple and I felt like I didn't belong. Um, 
but luckily it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to admit your weaknesses. There are people out there who want to help you. And for me, that was a great set of professors who encouraged me to keep going. It doesn't end um, after the first trip. Um, and you can do better than that. I went on, I got a great job. Um, I'm still in law school, so clearly it didn't completely uh, fail for me, um, but it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to fail. Um, everybody has to fail at least once. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I think we'll move on to the next question just for time's sake. So Tana's gonna ask the next one. Sure, thank you. Would any of you guys uh, choose a different career if you could start over? Why or why not? I can feel this one first. Um, the short answer is no. Um, I've known from a very early age that engineering and especially engineering related to the tech industry is something that I wanted to do. And so it was very easy for me to choose my direction and my major and career after that. So um, I recognize that that's not always the case for folks. Um, a lot of folks spend time in their early careers thinking that, um, that that is the career path for them and then quickly realizing that that's not the case and that's okay. Um, a lot of times what you learn about in school and what you experience in real life uh, differs and it's okay to want to change your mind and do something else. Um, I was fortunate not to have that, but it definitely is a thing that I see. Um, I know I've wanted to be in politics since I was a kid. Like I worked on my first political campaign when I was in eighth grade for a state senate race. Um, in that time, I've also I've changed my path within that realm. Uh, at one point when I first was in college, like, oh, you want to be a Hill staffer, and then I realized I want to be paid and have a, well, not a lot. If you're going to have no life, you're going to want to have a salary. And I kind of tried different routes. I was in a job, my first job, I did a lot of, I wore different hats. I did media buying, I did logistics, shoot arrangements, and different things like that. And now at my current job, I focus more on the, I'm on the media buying team and more in that focus. Um, and things with politics, so many other, so if, if you do change within politics, there's so many different ways you can go, whether it's um, your skills like in nonprofits or in sports and crisis communications, there's so many different routes you can go because politics isn't everything. <laughs> um, but I love what I do. I love the competitiveness of it. I like to win. And um, while I've had some changes within my own path, I've always knew like this was the direction I was going to go. Thank you both for those answers. Um, maybe have one more panelist answer this question. Sure, I'll, I'll go. I'll answer this one. Um, so I, I would say no. Um, I really enjoy the academic environment. Um, and I think all U.S. college students kind of recognize that. I mean, different people spoke to having you know, professors that really had an impact on them over the times in their, uh, during their I guess, academic career. But I really enjoy I think, teaching and mentoring students. It's really rewarding, um, and especially that we get to do that not only in a classroom setting, but in the research labs as well. Um, being able to conduct research with these students really keeps things new and interesting. Um, and plus, I get to be TCNJ's uh, CKI faculty advisor, so that's a bonus as well. Um, but I think it's also a long road, too, to be a professor. Um, I know there are many times where you know, many places where it's very possible that I could have exited, um, but I kind of just like stuck through it and then made it to the other side. Great, thank you all. I think I'll pass it over to Azal now for the question. All right, so this next question is, what has been like the biggest accomplishment of your career so far? Someone would like to start us off. Sure, I can start us off. Um, I think uh, in terms of a biggest accomplishment, maybe not praising as an accomplishment per se, but probably the most meaningful thing that has happened to me um, in my career has been getting to know the, um, I used to run an AmeriCorps program for a community clinic and health center called Lifelong Medical Care. And I was there for six years. I managed a team of AmeriCorps members, a new cohort every year for six years. And in total, um, I helped mentor and train over 80 AmeriCorps members, all of them who are fabulous doctors and health advocates and nurses and social workers out there um, in the world um, on the front lines. And I have to say that 
that was my biggest accomplishment only because um, I felt like um, that was the, the most meaningful experience for me to get to know every single one of those individuals and their strengths and their talents and to really see, um, uh, to see the impact that they have made in the underserved communities that we have served. And along the way during those six years, I have also met so many mentors. And I think um, that's something that I re would really like to encourage all you know college students and graduates upcoming graduates and recent graduates to reflect you know um as as you accomplish things in your career really reflect on you know who you know who are the folks who helped you get there you know are you know is it your family or is it your friends your colleagues your supervisor so now i would have to say um my biggest accomplishments were really achieved my most meaningful experiences were achieved and thanks to my mentors along the way All right, thank you. And would, we like, would someone else like to answer? I can add in here. Um, something that I left Circle K with was a dedication to service. And I think the accomplishment, it's not really a singular accomplishment, but the moment I'm most proud of at Google is when I realize the work that I'm doing at Google is still impacting the lives of others in a really positive way. And that really reiterated the fact that I was in the right place um, for what I wanted to do in my career. So what I would encourage all of you 2020 grads to think about is what is it that you value and how is it that you're able to accomplish that in the next stage of your career. It doesn't really need to be a particular job that you're working on, but the skills that you're building, do they align to your values? All right, thank you. And we have time for like one more before we move on to the next question. I can go. Um, so my biggest accomplishment I think would have been like the 2018 election cycle. Um, in the 2018 election cycle, I, my firm that I was working for at the time, we elected um, Kevin Kramer to the US Senate in a very, very bad year for ours. But in that race, I ended up doing a lot I had a lot of skin in the game and I sh it showed me that I, I was analyzing polling, looking at developing the messaging and it gave me the confidence. It's like, oh, I really can do this. And I had to fight for like, this is why we need to do this. This says this is why we need to do that and strategy. And so it made me feel, and then, um, so, um, it was um, just a very, um, it just gave you like, like, you're like this, I can do this. And it's not like, you're not just a bum on the log that you know that you can, like that, that you're in the room where it happens, take a Hamilton reference. Um, and you can, um, um, you can do these things and change the direction of the country, um, whatever you, what your beliefs are, whether you're an R or a D and, um, and it's, it was a great opportunity. And knowing that we defeated a, um, a, a an opponent that was very popular and very well funded, and that was a very huge accomplishment for me. All right, thank you. So now I'll pass it to Mackenzie to ask the next the next question. So the next question is, how do you manage a work life balance? I'll hop in there and start, um, mostly because I am currently a student as well right now. I'm also working an internship, I'm wedding planning, um, and I am the president-elect of my Kiwanis Club. So we're juggling a lot over here. Um, and for me, the biggest thing to juggling work-life balance was taking time for yourself too, because everybody wants you to do something. And it's okay to say no. Um, for me, I purposely moved to an area where I knew I had something fun nearby, which is Disney. Uh, not right now, but Disney is 20 minutes away. Um, and so for me, that was my little getaway. And it's okay to have a getaway, whether that's a good book, a cup of coffee, Disney. Um, take time for yourself. Because if you don't take time for yourself, you can't take time for other people. So I can jump in here as well. Um, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about, especially in the tech industry, um, where it's very easy for folks to overwork. It's very easy for things like Slack and Discord and all of these chat mechanisms to sort of disturb you at all hours of the day. Because, especially since we're working from home now, it's 
it's hard to have that hard boundary. But that was the one thing that I went into when I was looking for a job was you get to, to the point at the interview at the end where the interview person asks you, so do you have any questions for me? And that was my number one question was, what is your work-life balance? Like not beating around the bush, it was direct what, what happens at this company. And so with that in mind and building on that, um, I'm able to, fortunately, through, through the help of my managers and such like that, um, enforce like a very hard, like I'm on uh, during this set amount of time. Uh, outside of that time, don't contact me. Like, I'm not going to check Slack. I'm not going to look at notifications. There's no email. My laptop is off. And obviously, there's exceptions to that, like emergencies come up, and everybody knows how to get a hold of me. But setting the expectations early and reiterating them through the career as your management changes, as your title changes, is something that has helped me a lot. And so I'm very able to say, yeah, at 6 p.m., I'm off and I can go do my thing. And uh, there are no regrets um, from both my coworkers or the company um, to that effect. So um, it takes a lot of work to get there, but I think it's well worth it. You know, I like to say that, um, I like to share that we only have 24 hours in, uh, in every single day. And I like to think of um, those 24 hours as like, okay, I spend a third of, oh, well, I try to spend a third of that, uh, eight hours um, to, uh, for sleeping, <laughs> um, taking care of my health. Um, a third of that um, uh, for work. Um, I work about eight hours a day. And I try to think, I try to spend the other third on things that make me really happy. And I think, you know, things that um, things are that make me really happy at this moment in time is spending time with my nephews and nieces and, and spending time with my family, um, picking up my my violin, which I restarted yesterday um, because I've neglected it and I've neglected it for so long because I wanted to be a violinist um, in the past. Um, you know, just really, you know, not everything is about work. And I, I also acknowledge that that's a privilege to say that. Um, there are a lot of social and you know economical determinants right that drive your career success and um, so I just want to be mindful of that you know for folks that they may not have a choice um, but to uh, work long hours to um, to meet and uh, to, to meet um, to be able to address you know the needs in your life and so um, you know it's something that you know I also believe that you also have your uh, your supervisors and your your managers um, you know hopefully, you guys get to work for a team or a supervisor or manager that can um, help you achieve that work-life balance. You can't just accomplish it by yourself. Um, so there are a lot of different factors that um, are at play when you're trying to achieve work-life balance. It's not just all on you. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is one of the toughest things, especially in academics and research. Um, sometimes you just have to get things done. And especially through grad school, I mean, that's just not the culture. But I think one thing I found really helpful was that actually keeping and put um, keeping things updated on your calendar. I know everyone now has a Google calendar or you can use Outlook, but I mean, putting things down simple as lunch, right? Blocking off that time for yourself so that, you know, people are always gonna come after you, um, especially, you know, being a professor now, like, you know, everyone's coming to your office. And so, you know, things are gonna get busier and busier as you go through your career, no matter what path you're in. And so having things organized will give you a sense of how much you're working, as well as give you time to allocate to do things that you like as well. Yeah, I don't think work-life balance exists in the political realm, um, especially in an election year. Um, you're always expected to be on call. You can have stuff, stuff, you'll be up till like two o'clock in the morning and you gotta like figure out like, especially, well, not now because you're at home, but like, but you're like, oh, should I go home? I'm at the office or I could sleep on the couch. You start to question things like that. Um, I mean, now during quarantine, I, I um, I'm working from home. I mean, I try to get up really early and do like a workout and that's like my me time. But other than that, I'm always on call. I'm always working, um, always monitoring what's going on in Slack, email, um, because nothing, everything matters on election day. And if it, things, no one cares after and after election day, you can take all the vacation and time you want and you can relax and decompress. But until that point, <laughs> there is no work-life balance and you're always on, you always have to be on until November 3rd this year. <laughs> I can remember that. I think it's pretty obvious how 
important this topic is to each of us and the fact that each of us has decided to comment on this question. Um, someone once told me that work-life balance is not equal. And I think that really struck me because there's going to be times in your life where work will be all your time and other times where you can pull back, kind of like what Natalie said. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do, though, is to think about the boundaries that you're setting very, very early on in your career and be really intentional about setting that personal time on your calendar, taking lunch, making sure that you're working heads up, talking to people, networking every single week versus just being focused heads down. Um, there's a really, really good article I encourage every single person on this call to Google. It's called Live Your Life, I'm sorry, Live Your Eulogy, Not Your Resume. Written by Ariana Huffington on the Washington Post. On the Huffington Post. Go check it out. Read it every three months. And when you're getting down and really busy in your job, just come back to it and level out and remember what people are going to remember about you um, come the end of your day. Thank you all for sharing on that question. Your insight is very useful as we're getting ready to transition into our work lives. So um, Erica will be asking the very last question. All right, hello everyone. Um, so as someone who also, among many of us probably, graduated this past spring quarter slash semester, so the last question is, what advice do you have for the 2020 graduates um, with like, just like post-grad plans and like job searching and anything you'd like to add? There are uh, four things I always um, encourage students and recent graduates uh, to remember. Um, one, number one, um, practice curiosity 24-7. Follow your curiosity and identify your interests. The best way to um, do that is to do informational interviews with anyone and everyone um, that you um, are interested in interviewing or getting to know. Um, learn about the different occupations out there. Um, there's just so many um, opportunities out there in the world. Uh, secondly, optimism. Um, wonder, um, keep in mind, tell yourself how I can um, rather than I can't because. Um, so if you really believe that there are new opportunities are out there for you and that those opportunities are attainable, this attitude can help you remain persistent, um, even if there are setbacks. And I know it's a really tough time because of COVID-19. And, um, you know, it's, it's a really difficult time for everyone. Um, and so I think optimism is something that I really encourage you to remind yourself, you know, how I can rather than I can't because. Thirdly, risk taking. So expect the unexpected. You may get unexpected phone calls or emails or um, you may get hit up by a headhunter on LinkedIn or have chance encounters with, you know, random folks. Turn those chances into, um, into opportunities. Uh, take risks. Um, pursue new experiences, even if it's outside your comfort zone. And lastly, take action. Take action by learning, developing new skills, remain open, be flexible, follow up on those chance events and turn those chance events into um, potential career opportunities. Yeah, I mean, that's, this is a really tough one too because these are unprecedented times. Um, and I know that, you know, you're not gonna land your dream job right away. I mean, that's, you know, that's very, I, mean, I don't know, maybe this is like a Facebook effect. You see all these people doing great things, but you know, it's a long road. I mean, it takes you a while to get where you need to go. Um, and no matter how hard it gets, I think one thing I tell my students is always put your best effort and your best self forward um, because you never know who you're gonna meet along the way. And um, you know, the opportunities just show up. And so at, at least when you look back, you say, hey, I did my best. Um, uh, given the situation, and then that eventually, at some point, you'll get out the other side of the tunnel. I have two, two points, points I want to leave you with. with. One, one vote, vote this year. year. That is one, one of the most important, important things you can, can do this year for your future. future. Number two, remember, remember that, that your career, career is a journey, journey not a ladder. ladder. So there, there are going to be points where you take lateral moves, where you move what is perceived as going down to build a new skill that's going to help catapult the next level of your growth. Don't look at it as always climbing up. Going to the side is a very natural part of the process, and it's a very good step to take. Can you go up on your tower? All right, thank you so much. Um, from there, we will go ahead and move on. We have about 10 more minutes for a few audience questions. If you guys 
have any questions you can think of, please direct messages to Tana and she will share the questions with all of us. What is something that you all wish you did as 20 something year olds? Um, hmm, gosh, my young 20s. I don't think it was the best example <laughs> in terms of my, <laughs> the stuff I did in my life. Um, you know, back then in my young 20s, I wish I knew, I wish I had more financial literacy. And what I mean by that is knowing how to manage money. I know it sounds simple, but it's surprisingly a really complex thing to do. I wish I learned more about investments. I wish I knew how to, I knew, I, knew, I wish I knew how to boost my credit score, um, how to get a credit card and all this stuff. So I think money um, is something that has been really, um, uh, for me personally, it was something um, difficult to, to navigate. And I think I wish um, with financial literacy, um, I feel like it would have helped me make smarter choices financially <laughs> um, early on. Um, but you no, know, there's an amazing resource um, which I'll chat to um, Tana um, that I th that's free and um, has a lot of great guidance in terms of how you can boost your own financial literacy skills. Um, so I'll chat that over to Tana, um, and hopefully she'll chat it to everyone. Great. Definitely, Definitely plus, plus one, one Joe. Joe. I, I was just thinking, thinking the same thing. thing. I, I wish I'd gone to see a financial planner when I was 22 instead of when I was 32. Um, so plus, plus one to that. The other thing I'll say is build your network early. Try and meet one new person every single week if you can, because your next opportunity comes from the people you know. Great. Exciting that we're all here doing that. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, how do you guys find a, a balance between uh, having a job that you're passionate about and enjoy doing and finding a good paying job that helps pay the bills? Ooh, I, that, that's um, also, oh, oh, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. I mean, and that's a tough one. I mean, I think one thing I've learned going through grad school and then through a postdoc and then become a professor is that, you know, everyone knows about the poor grad student. And it doesn't matter how much money you make because you'll always, there's, you'll always have ways to find ways to spend it. And so I think, you know, do, do, um, go to a job that you're really passionate and enjoy. And then whatever you end up making, whatever that salary is, um, yeah, get that financial literacy, budget it out because unless you're, you know, living in, you know, San Francisco or these really expensive areas, you know, most jobs are going to pay well enough for you to, you know, survive on. Um, you may not get the latest um, things to spend money on, you know, newest iPhone and things like that or nicest car, but at least you're enjoying what you're doing. I'll add on, um, reach out to the people you know, um, especially your Kiwanians. They are great resources. Um, for me, if I had not met my local Kiwanis club, I would not have my job. Um, and because they afforded me the opportunity to get my job, I was able to do other things I enjoy doing while, you know, making a financial um, impact on grad school loans. Um, so reach out to those that are near you. There are Kiwanians in big places who are there to help you. Um, sometimes they're too afraid to reach out to you. Thank you both. The hardest thing in terms of finding a job is getting a good start, especially right now in this pandemic. How would you recommend finding a good starter job? My, one of my mentors have always told me, um, network or don't work. Um, and I think the power of networking cannot be understated. Um, I think every single job that I have, um, that I have um, landed through my career was a result of networking. It's all about who you know. Um, do not ever, ever, ever apply for a position in a random organization where you don't know a single human being because your resume or your um, CV, your application might go down this kind of like, you know, black hole. Um, and um, unless, you know, you're some stellar like celebrity or politician that everyone knows, then then yes, you might get a call back. But really leverage your network. And, and that's something that you can um, do uh, with tools like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the number one professional social media tool out there. Figure out who your first degree and second degree connections are. Um, leverage your connections through uh, Kiwanis International. Kiwanis is here for you as a resource. Um, and also um, just do your best to genuinely connect with others and um, network, uh, similar to what Zale said earlier. So 
um, that's, yeah, that's my advice. Um, I would say just cast the widest net possible. As someone who went through a big job search last year, I'm very, I'm, of course, we come as a different state, but I feel, I feel for you guys. Um, and just cast the widest net, meet with people. I had, you know, informational interviews, take those opportunities, you know, reach out to us, email us, give us a call. We're here to help you because we might know someone who knows someone who's hiring. And, and also when you're cast that wide net, don't say no, don't take yourself out of the running. Don't take yourself out, put yourself in the running. Cause if they, if you don't even throw your name in the hat, they don't know you exist. Great, thank you. To kind of build off of that, uh, what are some ways that you can build your network? What are skills that you need to have to be a good networker? Show up, up in, in that, that first conversation, conversation when you're reaching out to somebody. Do your due diligence and research who they are and what you think you could bring to the table in that conversation. It doesn't need to be something really fancy, but it has to be something that you can offer to them um, based on your own experience. So. I, I get a lot of outreach from LinkedIn working for Google, both from recruiters as well as people looking for jobs at Google. The ones I respond to are those that have done um, some really deep thinking and understanding what they would want to do at Google and what they bring to Google. So it shows me that they've taken more than two steps of just knowing the company's name and have a real point of view on what they want to do there. So. I would, I would say this for any networking, networking conversation, as well as any job application you do. To Joe's point, if you know somebody, it gives you a leg up. I personally came into Google not knowing anybody. So I came in through that very elusive path of putting my resume in a black hole. But I showed up, I went the extra mile, I did my research, I was prepared for those interviews. I brought a business plan in some cases for some of the interviews I've done since then. So think about how you can stand out amongst all the other applicants, whether it's in a message on LinkedIn or if it's an application that you're putting in for a session. I would say always send a thank you note. Like whoever you're meeting with, like if you're just meeting with someone, you know, now I guess virtually for an official interview or a phone call or whoever you interview with at a job, always send a thank you note because people remember that. If I get a thank you note, I'm like, oh, Sarah sent me a thank you note. You automatically have a higher view of them and you feel like they care, like they care about you and you're putting the effort in. Um, so thank you notes are the, take that extra 10 minutes, get some nice stationery, you know, get it done. And that's, that will help you land that, land that first gig. Got to send that thank you note. Okay, great. Our last question for you guys. What was the most difficult part of getting into high leadership position or competitive company or organization for you all? Um, I'll start from me. It was simply asking. Um, if I had not asked the person I did for my job, I would not have it. Some, not everyone will come to you and it is okay to ask because if you ask, you show them you are personally invested. Um, and sometimes they're ready to give that yes answer. Um, so if you're the first one to put yourself out there, you get the answer you want. I can jump in here and plus one everything Liz is saying, um, especially in a large organization where names can get buried and things like that. If you don't, if you don't have that conversation with your manager, if you already have a position or with your recruiter, like that sort of thing gets lost pretty easily um, because it relies on somebody else to remember you like it's promotion season or whatever, you're relying on your manager to fight for you or things like that. Whereas if you are putting your name forward, you are having that career conversation with them early on so that they have it in their mind like, oh yes, if the business requirements line up with your uh, aspirations, like that's an easy win for you and the business to put those two together. You just have to get that into the mind of the organization that you're in pretty early. I would just add to that, no who's in the room when those conversations are happening. Most often it's not just your manager, it's gonna be your manager, your manager's peers, maybe even your manager's managers. 
So the having influence on your full network around you is really important. And here's my work life balance. <laughs> I agree with everything that everyone has said so far. Um, lately, I have been uh, finding it really important to encourage folks to have that open conversation with your manager or supervisor about your staff development goals. Um, most companies have some kind of staff development process, um, and uh, it's an opportunity where you can discuss what is needed to achieve that next step in your career. Um, do you need more, um, do you need to go through more training or gain an X number of years around strategic planning or supervision or training, um, developing specific technical skills? So think about, you know, that, that plan and, and have that um, plan um, uh, open and uh, visible and transparent with your leadership and build allies and lean on mentors to help you reach that high leadership position. All right, so from here, I'll turn it over to Tana once again. She's going to explain Glimpse to all of you and give a quick tutorial. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you all so much for coming out and spending your evenings with us. Um, you are more than welcome to join us for this Glimpse session. I'm sure that people would love to meet you guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen, kind of explain what Glimpse is and how we are going to use it tonight. Everybody see it? Good. All right. So Glimpse is uh, a networking app, uh, and you can also use it just to meet your friends and your clubs if you want. You will be able to be paired one-on-one -on -one with um, someone else in your room. There's going to be six different rooms um, that are kind of based on different fields. And I'm going to explain how to get into the app in just a second. So. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. So when you um, first enter the app and you're, you're in our room and you're ready to be paired up, um, what's, what it's going to look like, uh, this is the mobile version right here. So it'll say um, who you're matching with um, and a little description if you were able to put a description in earlier. Again, if you haven't downloaded the app, please do, um, or you can access it on the web as well. Um, but you're going to need to accept the video chat. You have 10 seconds or it will automatically deny it. Um, so be sure to hit accept on um, both of you will need to. Um, you can skip it if you really want to, but um, don't. <laughs> uh, and you can also leave if you need to. Um, so this is what it looks like on the desktop version um, if you need to use that. So once you're in the call, you are able to do a, a couple of different things. So one really great feature is you can ask questions. Um, so these buttons here are icebreakers that we've been able to program in for you all that ask things like, you know, how did you get into your job? If you are finding it hard to speak to your friend um, that you've just met. Uh, this is how you leave, oh wait, hold on. Okay, so this 30 seconds button, uh, the calls are about two minutes and 30 seconds long right now. Um, but if you want to extend your call 30 seconds, just hit this button and you'll both have to hit it um, for the time to be extended. And of course, this is how you leave. If um, you need to. The call will automatically disconnect when you run out of time. So this is how you join Glimpse. So you go into your app and you enter this room key here, E0164. Don't enter this one. <laughs> um, E0164. Hit join room and then you'll be able to enter the room. You'll select what um, categories you kind of fall into. So if you're, you know, in STEM, in academia, um, go ahead and click that and it'll match you in with someone else in that room. So these are the categories that we have now. Um, STEM, business, nonprofit, social work, graduate school, communications and government, and education. Um, if you don't fit into one of those categories, I'm really sorry, um, just fit into whatever is kind of closest. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's how it looks for the smartphone. If you're joining from the web app, I'm gonna drop the link to join here uh, in just a second. But you'll click the link and you'll um, have to pretty much start over with your account. So you'll enter the confirmation number that it sends to your phone. Uh, you'll join in and do the same kind of thing. You have to select the categories that you are and the categories that you want to match with. And then you'll have to enter the room. And then you'll be able to either wait in the video lobby or go ahead and match with someone. So I'm going to leave it on this screen um, so you guys can uh, see this room key here. And I'm going to drop the, uh, the link to the, I'm sorry, hang on just a sec. I'm going to drop the link to the networking session in there. But um, if you want to leave this call on, you can. 
um, and you can join the Glimpse session from your phone and just mute the Zoom call. Um, but we will be returning to this Zoom call um, at 8.15 for closing remarks. So please be sure to come back um, and message me or Mackenzie if you have any questions at all.